Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, Native Plants versus Cultivars, Which to Choose. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter this evening, Connie Schmotzer. Connie has been gardening with native plants for 30 years and finds that there's always something new and exciting to learn. She has retired from her job of 22 years as consumer horticulture educator for Penn State Extension, where she concentrated on gardening with native plants to attract pollinators. Prior to joining the extension, Connie taught school in Williamsburg, Virginia, and she worked as a naturalist with the National Park Service in Wyoming. She has a Bachelor of Arts from Dickinson College and has done graduate work in soils at Montana State. Welcome, Connie. Hi, Kelly. Thank you very much. I'm so You're glad welcome. to be here on this cool, very, very chilly evening, but not quite as chilly as tomorrow evening is going to be. Um, so a good time to kind of just sit and talk about plants and think about what we're going to do this summer. So I have a lot to share with you tonight. Um, the native species versus cultivars is a topic that has come up uh, more and more because as native plants become popular with the public, you know, the horticulturalists are going to be creating cultivars for the marketplace and you're going to be seeing a lot of them. So I'm sure many of you are probably using some of them in your designs and your plans. But the question is, do these cultivars still benefit pollinators and wildlife, or are they just decorative items in the landscape? It's a complicated topic, and I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this should be titled not which to choose, but how to choose, because that's what I want to um, work with you on tonight. Um, in the last decade, there have been some trials out there that have given us some insight into the value of cultivars. Um, and how to choose these for the best uh, best plants to choose for pollinators and wildlife. So during the next hour, I want to share with you the results of some recent trials and hopefully have a takeaway for you um, of some guidelines that you can use when you're making your next plant selections. But first, um, I want to define the plants that we talk and we're talking about so everyone is on the same page. Native plants uh, have many, many different definitions. And for tonight's purposes, we're going to talk about plants that have developed in a region over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they're part of the ecosystem, part of the balance of nature in that particular region. They're referred to by many different names. The species is one of them. Straight species is what I tend to use, so you'll hear me using that term tonight. And some folks also refer to them as po open pollinated. So then what about native cultivars? Um, and native ours is a, a, a name that's out there. I don't particularly like it, but you will hear it. Um, so you need to be aware that it is, it is out there. These are plants that have been deliberately selected, crossbred, or hybridized for certain characteristics. Um, and plant breeding is com very complex. The propagator might be looking for increased disease resistant in a species, maybe a different color, maybe a shorter plant, um, maybe more big and bodacious blooms, longer bloom time, uh, even a different leaf color. There are many, many, many different things that they can select for. And many of these characteristics are selected because they appeal to us and to our aesthetics. And of course, that you know, makes sense because they want to sell these plants. Um, and then the characteristics that they have bred are maintained by vegetative propagation. Sometimes they can come true from seed, but more often uh, the genetics of these plants are all the same for every member of that, of that, particular, um, that particular cultivar. And then um, the horticulturist will give them a name. And cultivars are supposed to be designated by a single, by single quotes. And here is a good example. This is Echinacea double scoop. Um, a lot of times the, the name is, is meant to reflect what it was that they changed in, in the plant. Um, so where do all these cultivars come from? Well. It's not surprising that some of the plants that are selected 
uh, um, are actually from natural populations. Look at this picture of um, Blox paniculata. All of the plants in this picture came out of the same tray. Uh, they're all the straight species. But as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of change uh, and difference in color among these individuals, probably also in disease resistance as well. Uh, no doubt, you know, powdery mildew resistance is different from one to the other. So um, this, on, on this, the uh, characteristics are carried by the seed. This is a straight species. So if you took 100 seeds and put them out there, they would all be a tiny bit different, a lot of variation. And when you see that variation in nature, it's not terribly surprising that some of the cultivars that are created are actually what we call natural selections. You know, a propagator is walking around a natural area, sees a plant of a population that's just a little bit different and likes it and takes it back, collects it, vegetatively propagates it, so that it is a clone. Every, every plant that comes from that is a clone of that particular plant. Phloxgena, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, or perhaps most of you. And this was actually a plant discovered along the Harpeth River down in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was named after the person who discovered it, uh, who's Jenna Pruitt. And Jenna kind of caught her eye because it was exceptionally mildew free. And so that plant went back and was propagated um, and is now in the, in the trade. But not all plants that are cultivars of natives are natural selections. Some of them are deliberately uh, bred or hybridized. So um, in some cases, a native, two native plants could be crossbred to introduce traits from one variety or line into a new genetic background. But very often, hybrids are crosses between two different species, not just, not just one species. The parents of a hybrid could be both native. They could both be non-native, or they could be one of each, a cross of each. So here's an example. I don't know if, how many of you know Ethereum ghost. This is, um, this is Our Lady Fern. But not exactly our lady fern. It's a cross between our native lady fern and the Japanese painted fern to create a very different looking plant. Okay. And actually, uh, when you start down this road, it can be very difficult to find out the parentage of a cultivar. According to our naming conventions, X should designate a hybrid. So down here at the bottom, you have Helenium X culturum. That, that is designating a hybrid. But often, it's left out of a cultivar name. So Helenium Morheim beauty, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, is actually a hybrid. But you wouldn't know that from the name. Okay. I have seen it listed as Helenium autumnale, which is our native. Morheim beauty, which would lead you to think that this is actually a, um, you know, a cultivar of our native. But when you go to the Dutch website where it was created, because it was created in the Netherlands, you find out that it is a cultivar of two different Helleniums. And I haven't been able to figure out which Helleniums. It could be a cross between Autumnale and Hoopsii or Biglovii. It's really hard to tell. Okay. And sometimes the species name, actually, not sometimes, most often, the species name is missing. They will list it as an Agastache, but they won't tell you what species it is. Or, as in this case, Agastache funiculum blue fortune, that's leading you to believe that this is our native, a cultivar of our native. Because our native is Agastache paniculum. But if you do a lot of digging, you will find out that it is not Agastache paniculum. It's actually a hybrid, and it's a cross between Agastache rugosa, which is from Asia, and our native Agastache paniculum. Okay, so have I confused you yet? I've confused myself for sure. 
and going down this road, um, you know, it's 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 not a straight path by any means. And over the years, there's been a lot of research done on the garden worthiness of plants. You know, how hardy they are, uh, how florif floriferous they are, and how they how they actually stand up in a garden. But fortunately, lately, there's more research coming out on how these plants actually um, have value to the ecosystem, or do they have value to the ecosystem? So that's that's a nice change that we're seeing because almost 90% of our flowering plants depend on insect pollinators. And these pollinators are in decline. A lot of them are in decline because they just don't have the food that they need, which of course is connected to the plants that are in our gardens. Bird numbers have fallen as well um, by quite a bit since 1970. So all of these, all of these factors uh, are leading researchers to say, you know what, it's time for us to look at these plants in a different way and get the information to the gardener that they need to choose good plants for the ecosystem. And as climate change, habitat loss and degradation in agriculture have been kind of listed as the top reasons or most important stressors for pollinators. So as we lose meadows such as this one out in Iowa, it's more important than ever that we choose the best plants possible in our landscape plantings, because our landscape plantings are very rapidly replacing areas like this. So when you're, you're dealing with cultivars, I've kind of divided this into two different sections. There are two main considerations that you have to look at. The first one, uh, that plants, can, can the plant leaves be eaten by insects, especially caterpillars? And I'm sure that everyone here has heard of the work uh, by Doug, Dr. Doug, Douglas Tallamy, have heard him speak, showing that insects can only eat plants that they have co-evolved with, which is very important for the other animals that are using those insects to feed their young. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, do the flowers of those plants still support pollinators with nutritious pollen and nectar? And so if you use this as your guideline in choosing cultivars, um, and if you're looking to choose plants that will function to create a good ecosystem, uh, you'll, be, you'll be good. So what I want to share with you tonight are five different research studies. Uh, one that was done by Dr. Talamy and his student at, at Mount Cuba. This is on woody plants. And then the rest of these are all on perennials, on perennial flowers. Our bees, bugs, and blooms uh, was one the master gardeners did from 2012 to 2015 at our research center. We did a statewide pollinator preference study um, with the master gardeners, which I'd like to share with you. And then Annie White, uh, who did her PhD research up in Vermont back in 2016, has a lot of good information for us. And then lastly, the ongoing Mount Cuba Center plant trials. So let's start out with uh, Emily Baisden and Doug Tallamy's study in 2018. Their premise was, do cultivars of native trees and shrubs provide the same ecological value as their parent straight species? Um, and results were published on this back in, in 2018. They were looking for Lepidoptera caterpillars feeding on 16 species of woody plants, both trees and shrubs, and the cultivars of each species. They planted the species in the middle of a ring, and they surrounded all of those by the cultivars matched to each species, and they monitored them regularly for visitation by and well actually for Lepidoptera eating the plants. They were looking at six different traits in the cultivars. One, some of the cultivars that had been enhanced to give you really good fall color. Leaf variegation was another one. A change of habit, uh, mostly stature. Did they make a, a dwarf plant? Um, disease resistance was important. Enhanced fruiting. And then lastly, cultivars 
that uh, had the green leaves changed to red or purple. And I'm going to kind of, um, you can read this study on your own. I'll give you that link. But I'm going to kind of kind of shortcut this to the, the quick. And there was only one trait in the cultivars that actually deterred the feeding of the caterpillars. And as you might guess, that was when the leaves were changed to red or purple. None of the other changes seem to affect the caterpillar feeding. So why did the leaf color um, affect the herbivory or the feeding of the caterpillars on the leaves? Well, red leaves remove chlorophyll from the leaf and they're loading up with an anthocyanins and anthocyanins are feeding deterrents. So a plant such as nine bark, which has been a host for several moths, uh, will lose its plant value when it changes its color to red leaves. So when you're deciding on plants to sustain insect populations and food for nesting birds, especially the trees and shrubs, you might want to bypass those plants that have red and purple leaves, or at least limit their use, knowing that that's going to cut down on the number of caterpillars in your yards, okay? Um, so this is a straight species of nine bark, and it's called, the main cultivar of nine bark that I know is red is Diablo, or there are probably some others as well. So go with this one instead of the, the Diablo. I've included the link for Dr. Talamy's study here on the slide, and uh, please feel free to go and read the entire paper for more details. So the second question then is how do cultivars of native flowering plants affect pollinators? And this is an important one, and this is where most of the research so far has been done. I want to share with you our bees, bugs, and blooms study that we did from 2012 to 2015 at our research station near Lancaster. We planted 84 different species of plants. Each plant had a plot of um, three three each, three plots each, five by five, and we planted some of their cultivars as well. Plants that we chose, we already knew would be fairly, um, fairly valuable for pollinators. So we wanted to see the relative value of these, especially, especially with those cultivars. We concentrated on bees mostly, but we also noted wasps, beetles, butterflies, and moths. And our observations that we that we did were boosted by collection and then having experts ID the insects that we had collected. The cause of our pairings were what I want to share with you today. We did quite a few cultivars, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Um, Menarda fistulosa, the wild bergamot, I know most of you probably have in your gardens. It's an incredible pollinator plant and a very important one. There is a cultivar out there that sometimes is easier to get hold of than the straight species, and that's called Claire Grace. Well, Claire Grace is actually a natural selection. It was discovered in Mississippi by folks at Southern Perennials, and it was named for their daughter. So if you wonder how some of these uh, cultivars get their names, there are many, 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 many different pathways. And as you can see, uh, the main difference probably in the plant is, is the intensity of the color. So here's the comparison over three years of those two plants. And Menarda fistulosa straight species on the left, you can see is outperforming uh, Claire Grace quite a bit. Um, it was also much more vigorous than Claire Grace. And it's still going strong in 2022, uh, whereas Claire Grace disappeared from the plots in about five years. We wondered a little bit if that's because it's, it, its genetics are actually from a warmer climate and it was having a little bit more trouble with our, with our Pennsylvania climate up here. A little hard to say. Because it comes true from seed, it may have also kind of ended up being absorbed back into the straight species and crossed back. 
We also took a look at a couple of penstemons. Uh, penstemon is an important pollinator plant for bumblebees. As you can see, the, uh, the structure of the flower is just absolutely perfect for bumblebees. We compared the straight species with Husker's red. And it's interesting, Husker's red came from the University of Nebraska. Um, the Huskers, I had, had no idea that that was related to the football team. Um, but a fellow there had found a penstemon seedling that had some reddish tints in the leaves and the veins. And he worked for quite a few years to cultivate that and come up with it with the Huskers red. When we first planted the, uh, the plots, the straight species tray also had quite a few uh, plants in it with red tinged leaves in, in the veins. Uh, so it wasn't difficult to see where Huskers red had originally come from. Oh, backwards here. All right. So the cause of our comparisons of the Penstemon digitalis and Penstemon digitalis Husker red, um, not a lot of difference. They pretty much performed about the same as far as serving the bumblebee community. And so we just sort of claimed this a tie. It really doesn't matter which one of these you have in your garden. They're both going to do just fine. I did a couple of asters. Uh, the first one was New England aster. And we compared that straight species with the cultivar purple dome which is very highly available at most garden centers. Purple Dome is much shorter and compact, and we knew that it was probably much preferred by gardeners that were looking for a, a smaller plant <coughs> rather than the larger straight species. And Purple Dome was actually a, a roadside discovery as well, uh, discovered up near Allentown, Pennsylvania and it was introduced to the trade by Mount Cuba later on. But as you can see, it was not at all preferred by pollinators. The straight species on the left, uh, much preferred over Purple Dome. In fact, to the point where we, we didn't want to call any of the plants in our trial a failure, but this one came pretty close. And in addition, it had disease issues and it disappeared from the plot by the fourth year, whereas the straight species is going quite strong even today. Now we don't know, this is, this is one trial, we had 84 species of plants out there. And what we don't know is whether having that huge smorgasbord of food um, made it hard for pollinators that they chose you know, they chose the other plants. And if, if Purple Dome was by itself and the only thing out there, would they use it? Don't know. Um, that's something that, that we would like to look into. The second aster that we looked at was Smooth Aster. This is actually one of my favorites. And we compared it with the cultivar called Bluebird. Bluebird was discovered up in Connecticut back in 1988 and as a spontaneously occurring seedling in a garden. And it was introduced to the trade by Dr. Richard Lighty down at Mount Cuba. As you can see from the picture, Bluebird has quite a few more blossoms than the straight species. And that probably affected the outcome of our pollinator study. As you can see, Bluebird was generally more attractive to pollinators than the straight species. And I think, again, it's because there were so many blossoms out there and so much nectar and pollen available for them. Um, it also scored very high for pollinator diversity in that it, it, um, it attracted a variety of different kinds of pollinators. Also interesting to note that Bluebird has seemed to be a little bit more hardy than the straight species in our plots. Uh, they're both still there, but Bluebird is, seems to be doing just a little bit better. And then we have Coreopsis reticulata. Uh, since we did this study, there are probably 10 or 15 more cultivars out there. 
And, it, and in fact, this is a difficult one to find the straight species when you're when you're searching for it at a garden center or a nursery. Um, we compared the species, straight species in the middle there with Zagreb, which was actually uh, originated in Croatia at the University of Zagreb. And we compared that with Moonbeam. We found out much later that Moonbeam is probably a sterile hybrid of Coreopsis verticillata and Coreopsis rosea and isn't, um, you know, isn't straight out of verticillata. So that's interesting. So results of this, Zagreb was better than the straight species in pretty much all cases. And like we think once again, it was because it had more blossoms per square foot than either of the other two. What's interesting, however, is that both Moonbeam and Zagreb faded out after six years. They're no longer in the plots, whereas this trait species is still going strong. Um, so we feel that besides the attractiveness to pollinators, you also have to think about a cultivar's vigor and whether it will still be there for pollinators in future years. I also wanted to make note of uh, one of the Joe pies that we had in our in our uh, trial, and that was one called Bartered Bride. This is a form of hollow stem Joe pie. We actually thought that the color from change from kind of lavender pink to white might be a deterrent to pollinators, but that wasn't the case at all. Uh, we now know that pollinators see white quite differently than we do, and white is actually one of the favored colors for pollinators. And Bartered Bride ranked pretty high for both um, the diversity of pollinators that visited it, as well as the number of bees and surface flies that we counted on it. So this was one of those that, that we feel we could definitely recommend. Uh, let me go back one second. The, um, the full results of this study can be found at this, um, this website, and we will try to put those, we're going to try to put them up on our um, research farm website as well. So there's some other cultivars in there that you may want to look at, as well as we ranked the top 20 for pollinator diversity and also for pollinator numbers. Okay. The second study I want to share with you is pollinator preferences. This was a citizen science project of the Penn State Master Gardeners. It was a statewide program. We involved about 22 counties across the state. Um, plants were provided to the master gardeners in these counties, and they monitored, monitored them for three years. Again, we wanted to know how the straight species was faring against the cultivars for pollinator visitation. So the plants that we chose to monitor that first year, that first set of years, was Agastache, Arianotissa, Helenia motomnale, Helen's flower, and cultivars, and Physostegi virginiana, and two cultivars. Okay. We didn't know as much as we know now about these cultivars when we started this. The 33 counties across the state, and that was important because anywhere from, um, from Montgomery County up to, um, up to Erie County, representing a lot of, of different geography, a lot of different weather situations. And 22 counties completed all three years, um, so we were able to compare the results from these different physiographic regions. What were we looking for? Well, we wanted to keep it simple. Monitoring for pollinators is hard. It's, they're flying fast, they don't stay long, and it's very difficult to identify many of them on the wing. So we kept it kind of simple. We did honeybee, bumblebee, the green metallic bee, and the carpenter bee, plus any butterflies that were noted. Okay? And that way we, we could be pretty sure that our data was all going to be, uh, to be accurate. So in the Agastache trial, 
up on the left corner is a straight species. And then we looked at black adder. We looked at golden jubilee and we looked at blue fortune as well. It was interesting that after the fact, we learned that um, blue fortune, which outperformed all of them, was actually a hybrid. Golden Jubilee, which was actually quite bad, is actually Agastache rugosa and not a not related at all to our native. So here's this, the statewide summary for that. As you can see Blue Fortune and Black Adder are kind of the standouts for the total number of pollinators and then the straight species. And then Golden Jubilee, uh, which is a which is straight Agastache rugosa, we think. Um, is not doing well at all. And that plant also did not fare very well in the gardens. The Hamedium trial, we used a straight species, a cultivar called Mardi Gras, and the Morheim Beauty that we have uh, talked about before. When we purchased them back in 2012, um, they were all listed as cultivars of the straight species. We now know that but that's not the case. And while the cultivars are certainly eye-catching and might have been preferred just on aesthetics by many gardeners, they were definitely not preferred by pollinators. And in all cases, the straight species was more attractive to pollinators than any of the other cultivars. And the same actually ended up being the case for the obedient plant. Um, as with the Hellaniums, the straight species was, was preferred. We looked at Vivid, could not find out where Vivid came from, um, what its origin is. Miss Manners was actually selected in Massachusetts at a nursery from a mixed population of open pollinated seedlings. Um, and we think it came from Physostegia virginiana rosea, which is a, a, you know, a subset of the of the Virginiana. So when we look at the results of that uh, pairing, you can see the straight species definitely is preferred to either of the other um, either of the other cultivars. So I'm going to move on to Annie White's work. Annie did her PhD up in Vermont. And she did a pairing of these different cultivars and straight species as well. Um, and she found some very interesting things. Some of the plants that she used were um, intensively bred. Some were natural selections, as we've talked about before. Some were hybrids. And Annie, um, I want to thank Annie for letting me use this picture. She also said to uh, mention that some of the species designations that she has on here are no longer correct. Here we can look at Agastache funiculum. Uh, we now know that it is not Agastache funiculum, Golden Jubilee, it's Agastache rugosa. But that, a lot of that information was not, um, not out there at the time when she was selecting her plants. So her results were interesting. Um, quite interesting. After monitoring for three years, she found that about half of the cultivars in her study were comparable to the native species, half were inferior. There was one exception, and that was Culver's root, lavender towers. Um, lavender towers was selected by a German plantsman, and um, we suspect it was from a natural selection because we have seen other covers roots that actually have a lavender tint to them. So we think it was selected from, um, from a seedling of the covers roots. One of the most interesting things that Annie discovered, which I have really taken to heart and uh, I think about a lot when I'm selecting plants now, was nectar studies. She looked at Lobelia cardinalis, cardinal flower, and she looked at Lobelia syphilitica, great blue Lobelia. 
she studied patterns of nectar in both of these. And what she noticed was that the cardinal flower um, was visited by hummingbirds. That was pretty much the main or maybe even the only pollinator that was visiting. He has a long, narrow corolla tube, the flower does, which is perfect for that hummingbird beak. Nobilia syphilitica has a much different shape flower, a much shorter tube, much wider, and it's absolutely perfect for bumblebees. So in her trial, the cardinal flower was being visited by hummingbirds and the Nobilia syphilitica was being visited by bumblebees. And she said, you know, I wonder, I wonder about the nectar in these plants. She said, Lobelia syphilitica is an interesting plant being visited by bumblebees. Let's take a look at, at how much nectar is actually in the plant. And she measured it and found that it was 0.79 microliters, which was just about right for the size of the bee. Okay, so the bee's visiting, getting as much nectar as he needs. But the cardinal flower, wow, a whole lot more nectar in the cardinal flower, 5.7 microliters. That made sense because a hummingbird is much bigger and the hummingbird needs that much nectar to draw out of the plant. So these two plants are absolutely perfect for the pollinators that are coming and visiting them. But in her trial, she had one other plant and that was Lobelia fan scarlet. As you can see, it's a hybrid and it's actually a hybrid between the great blue lobelia and the cardinal flower. They've hybridized those to create this new plant. The new plant was being visited by hummingbirds because it retained that shape of the flower that was perfect for hummingbirds. But when she looked at the nectar, it only had, in fact, it had less nectar than the blue lobelia, which was being visited by the bumblebee. So the hummingbird is still being attracted to this plant, but getting just a fraction of the amount of nectar that it needed uh, for its energy supply. And so that hummingbird is gonna have to visit a whole lot more of those flowers and expend a whole lot more energy to get the same nectar that it would from the straight species. So that really, um, really kind of made me think about this. We would only know this if because of Annie's work, and there's so much more to know out there. Um, nectar studies are not as common as I'd like them to be. It's very difficult to do, and we really need more people to take a look at that. We also know that nectar changes from one plant to another, the protein lipid content, and that would affect different pollinators. So there's much more to be done. The other thing Annie noticed was that some of the cultivars were disconnected with bloom time. Uh, sometimes it was just a little bit of a disconnect as up here with the Baptisia australis. But sometimes as the case of, this is Hellenium straight species and Hellenium Morheim beauty, it's a huge disconnect. So if you're planting Morheim beauty, thinking that you're serving the same pollinators as the straight species, you're not, because they're blooming at a very different time. So this topic of cultivars is complicated and there's a lot to think about. One thing that we, we wanted to do was compare some of our work with Annie's work. And in most cases, um, our findings were the same as hers. There was one difference and that was in her work, Claire Grace did pretty well. And in our trials, Claire Grace did not perform nearly as well as the straight species. Um, also in Annie's study, Claire Grace was not hardy. Of course, she's doing work up in, in Vermont and this plant member comes from the deep south. Okay, so Annie's conclusion was that the more manipulated the cultivars are, the less attractive they are to pollinators. So that's kind of a take home message to us. Um, 
when you have a lot of repeated selections in breeding programs to, to change things a lot or make them hybrids, you definitely do lose the value to pollinators. To learn more about Annie's work, I encourage you um, to actually download her thesis. And there's this wonderful video presentation that she did to a group up in Massachusetts. Um, very, it, she talks about her nectar studies, um, very, very worthwhile spending half an hour or so listening to that video presentation. So I, I encourage you to do that. And then lastly, Mount Cuba Center. I'm sure most of you know about Mount Cuba Center. It's um, in Hawkinson, Delaware, just across the line from Pennsylvania. And Mount Cuba Center is dedicated to inspiring an appreciation for the beauty and value of native plants. They're also committed to protecting the habitats that sustain these plants. So uh, if you haven't been, we definitely encourage you to go. Besides being um, a wonderful repository for many different kinds of native plants, they're also doing a lot of research. We have a dedicated research team and a huge trial garden that evaluates native plants and their, and their cultivars uh, for horticultural things, such as bloom rating, you know, disease resistant hardiness, but they're also doing a lot of studies um, on the ecological value of the plants. There's a pollinator watch team of volunteers that helps collect that data on pollinator visitation. And this picture was taken during one of their Minarda trials. Um, besides being scientifically helpful, um, they're also quite beautiful. So many plants have been evaluated to date they have new trials coming up each year. These are just a few of the reports that have been um, have been created. You can find all of them on the web. And uh, when you're searching for plant selection, I highly encourage you to go and take a look at these reports. In addition, they have partnered um, with the University of Delaware staff and students have used their trial gardens um, to conduct a variety of research um, Doug Tallamy's and Emily Basin's um, study was done at Mount Cuba and Owen Cass had done one this is this is his study he had looked at pollen and nectar in the plants uh, as well as visitation by pollinators far too many trials for me to talk about and the time allowed um, so I just want to talk about a couple of them, and I encourage you to visit their website for more information. Fox trial. Um, as you know, there are many, many dozens of different types of phlox paniculata of all phlox out in the trade. In fact, finding the straight species of some of these flocks can be very, very difficult. Um, so they trialed a whole lot of different flock species, including shade, sun-loving species. And Keith Nevison um, from the University of Delaware did the citizen scientist volunteer and, and research work on the attractiveness of these plants to pollinators. There's a lot in this report. I encourage you to, um, to definitely download it, take a look at it. I want to highlight just one portion of it, and that's Phlox paniculata. 50 cultivars were trialed, um, which is a pretty good portion of what has been developed so far by horticulturalists. Um, and it's in, there's a beautiful plant. It's a very good garden plant. It is actually a plant that originates on, um, on floodplains. So unlike a lot of our native plants that like very poor, miserable soils, this one, this one likes a nice garden soil and a little bit of compost probably added into it. So they looked at these 50 different cultivars, um, again, looking at them for their attractiveness to pollinators. And guess which one came out on top for pollinators? It was 
Jenna, the one we've looked at before. Natural selection, um, and you can see how much more attractive it was for butterflies than any of the others as you go down that as you go down that list. Um, and not that the ones at the bottom of the list aren't aren't okay. They are still attracting pollinators, but wow, this one this one's kind of off the charts. And I have personal experience with this one, and I can tell you that if you have it even in a pot, pollinators will will follow it around, especially the tiger swallowtail, which you see here on the plant. Keith Nevison wondered why it was that this plant was attracting four times, 14 times more than others um, and thought maybe it was the nectar content. So he looked at that rather carefully, but it showed no correlation at all. So the new hypothesis on this might be that these flowers are smaller on Jenna, um, not, as, not as large and bodacious. They have a narrow and shallow flower tube, and perhaps butterflies find that much easier to use to get in and get the nectar. Uh, and maybe the many different flowers on the head might also be a help in that they can stay on one, one head of flowers and collect a whole, all the nectar that they need. And I also wanted to briefly mention the results of the Hellenium trial, um, because we've talked about that several times um, in the duration of this, this presentation. Mount Cuba trialed many, many more cultivars than we did in our, any of ours. But the results came out the same, as you can see here. The straight species, Helenium um, autumnale, came out on top as far as attracting the pollinators or the most pollinators. And this past year, Mount Cuba wrapped up a five-year study of three different species of hydrangeas and their cultivars. They looked at hydrangea arborescence, at hydrangea radiata, and hydrangea cinerea. And the interesting part of this study for me is the difference between the lace caps and the mop heads. Wild type hydrangeas uh, are pretty much lace caps. So the bulk of the flowers in the head of a lace cap, which is all of these little guys, are very, very small, but they are very, very rich in nectar and very rich in pollen. Outline those are these larger flowers, which people find, I think, aesthetically pleasing, but they're sterile and they are strictly calling cards. Um, so when, as the pollinators fly over, they see these large flowers, they say, oh, well, must be something good down there. They come down, find out these are sterile, and spend all of their time in these nectar and pollen rich small flowers. So that's the lace cap of hydrangea arborescens. Then there is a cultivar of hydrangea arborescens in which the horticulturalists have said, well, you know what? People probably aren't going to like the looks of this so much because it's not real showy. How about if we take these sterile flowers and we have a whole bunch more of the sterile flowers um, to create this very large, beautiful uh, cluster of flowers? And so Annabelle and many, many cultivars like it dominate the industry when you go to buy a hydrangea. But in the trials at Mount Cuba, they're find really a dead end for pollinators because all those flowers are sterile. So while it's a beautiful plant, it really has no value for the pollinators. Their trial report is published and I uh, highly encourage you again to, uh, to download that and take a look at it. Um, there's some interesting findings in there. And one of the things that you'll find in that report is that of the cultivars, whoops, let me go back here. Of the cultivars, 
um, of the straight species Hydrangea arborescens Haas halo um, came out very well for attracting pollinators, but you can see it has kept those small flowers and kept the sterile flowers to a minimum. And of the mop heads that um, just have larger flowers on them, there was one called Invincible Spirit that actually performed fairly well for pollinators. So this is a great resource for anybody going to purchase any kind of, of um, hydrangea arborescence or any, any of the hydrangeas. Please take a look at it uh, before you buy. Mount Cuba is continuing their research and there's so much more to, um, to learn. Um, right now they have a Solidago goldenrod trial going on. Uh, many, many different, different species of goldenrods there, along with some of the favorite cultivars, such as golden fleece, fireworks, and others. Uh, so I'm very interested in seeing the results of this when that trial is finally completed. They are also doing a trial of ironweed or vernonia. Um, they're beautiful, beautiful flowers to begin with, and there's so many different, uh, different kinds there that they are um, looking at for garden worthiness and pollinator visitation. So if you're in the area this summer, um, those trial gardens are definitely worth a visit. And stay tuned to the Mount Cuba website for, um, for more information on those cultivars. So those are the studies that I've wanted to cover this evening. The question is, what, what are the takeaways from these different studies? Are cultivars useful for pollinators and for wildlife? Well, the answer to that really is, it depends. So if you decide that you're going to use cultivars, or perhaps the cultivar is the only thing that you can find uh, and you want to use one, Look for open pollinated seed, seed grown selections if you can, you know, such, as, such as Jenna. Avoid cultivars with any change of leaf color. Definitely avoid those with red or purple leaves. Avoid cultivars that have flowers that are quite different from what the straight species is. Double flowers are particularly a problem because when you create a double flower, you're probably getting rid of most of the nectar and most of the um, most of the pollen. And if you aren't, you're confusing the insects greatly because they have no idea where to go to get them. Uh, try to stay away from a cultivar that has a different bloom time than the straight species, and avoid those sterile flowers. Um, take some research to figure all of this out, but. We're getting to the point where there's more information out there for us. And when in doubt, choose the native straight species as much as you can. You can't go wrong with them because there's a couple hundred thousand of years of evolution there um, to make sure that all of these guys can use the flowers that we're putting into, into our yards. Purchasing straight species can be a little bit challenging. Um, I encourage you to go on to your state's Native Plant Society for list. Um, I think I think Maryland Native Plant Society has list of of nurseries. You know, talk to your fellow gardeners. There are a lot of online sources now that you can search for. We have worked with the pollination um, who has donated some of the, the plants that we used in pollinator preferences, and they're selling plant plugs. They have some cultivars, but also many, many straight species. And once you get connected into this network, um, you won't find it quite as difficult to find these plants, sometimes sw plant swaps, uh, conservation organizations that are selling, selling plants. They're out there, just takes a little bit of work. And for those of you that are interested in, in learning more or helping out with citizen science, you might want to check out Budburst. This is the Chicago Botanic Garden Project. And they, you can actually become part of this project and monitor pollinator visits to different native species in their cultivars, which will help us to add to the, um, 
to the knowledge that we have already. Don't know if they're going into into 2023. They definitely went through the fall of 22, and you should be able to find some more information at their website. And with that, does anyone have any questions? We actually did have a few questions. Um, the most prevalent one was, will this recording be available so that we may watch it again? So thank you so much, Connie. Um, I know you can only see me right now, but um, more than 140 people have been connected to this webinar. So um, you've touched a lot of um, gardeners this evening. Um, folks, if you have any questions, feel free to type them now. Um, Sandra had wondered where Mount Cuba Center is, which you've already kindly offered <laughs> um, that answer. Um, Janine had wondered um, if a copy of the slides might be available in addition to the recording. That's a question for you. It would be hard. There's um, thousands of megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. but we've got the recording, so that's wonderful. You have the recording, so that'll be good. Okay. Um, and I apologize to Christine. She had wondered or asked for the link again of somewhere about the 718 mark. So it was one of the earlier links, one of the first you reference. Um, but hopefully um when we go through um the recording, she'll find that. So my apologies to Christine. I was multitasking and troubleshooting for folks at the time she asked. Um uh David has a question. Um why wouldn't an extended bloom time of two related cultivars benefit pollinators? It's. I'm assuming, David, you're thinking that you'd have. That you would have both the cultivar and the straight species, and that would extend the bloom time. Uh, it's it's the mismatch of bloom time. That's a problem. So if you have a, if you have a helenium that normally blooms the last three weeks of August and is serving the pollinators that are available in that time. And you create a cultivar that is blooming, doesn't overlap with that, and is blooming the last two, three weeks of July. Now you have a plant blooming at a time when its pollinator isn't available. Um, now, climate change is <laughs> throwing us all kinds of, of um, curveballs with that one too, because climate change is causing causing some mis mismatches. Um, we're seeing that now with the warm weather we've had and the my, my maple trees are trying to bloom, and now we're going to have 12 degrees tomorrow. So, um, so there are a lot of challenges for these pollinators, and it's it's not so much having them bloom at the same time and longer. It's having them bloom at the time when the pollinator that's using them is active and available. If that makes sense. Yep. Um, David had a follow up. Um, is there a standard definition of native? It seems that a native in Virginia also may be classified as native in Connecticut or Nebraska. And I know you touched on some of that at the beginning, but that was um, the question. Yeah, there's so many definitions of native. Some people will say it has to be native within 50 miles. And we draw a much bigger, I can I tend to draw a mid-Atlantic circle. Um, and you know, it's something that's native in the Piedmont in several different states is probably gonna be the same. Yes, there are there are there are plants that are native over a wide range, some of them over half of the United States. Within that range, there are local ecotypes. For instance, red maple is a good example. A red maple that originates up in northern Massachusetts or Vermont, and a red maple, same species, that originates down in, in South Carolina, are going to be a little different. They're the same species, but they're going to be different ecotypes. Um, I know that because I have three maples in our yard and they all bloom and lose their leaves at different times. They were here when I moved here and I'm sure that the seed source for those came from different parts of the country. And those timings are kind of imprinted in the seed, in the genetics of the seed, which are then the genetics of the tree. So, so yes, um, you know, there are. There are many, many, many native species that where my sister lives up in Boston, 
you know, same species is down here. But if you collected seed from an indigenous plant in each place, there would be differences. You know, it might grow in a slightly different soil. Um, columbine is a good example. Our native columbine. We have two different ecotypes: one that grows on limestone soil, one that grows on acidic soil. Um, same species, but the genetics are just slightly different. And it's it's really hard when you're trying to buy a native plant native to your region. Um, you know, it we're kind of stuck with whatever whatever we can get. Um, and if you can if you have a, a native seed source, or um, you know that you can you can use is great. But staying with the same species and yeah, the the ecotypes are nice, but. Probably not going to be within the reach of most of us. If we can get the species, the straight species, we'll be fine. Thank you. Um, a lot of uh, positive yeah, feedback. Great program. Great speaker. Thank you. Um, requests for some of the links. I can do my best to capture them as I'm um, getting the recording ready for YouTube. But if you have like just a list of some of the links you've shared and might be able to share them with me or, or Jean or someone, That's that would be great. Okay, I'll send you an email, Kelly. Awesome. That's great. And another question from Janine. She wondered how they, she could follow you and your work online if such a place exists. <laughs> um, our work at, at Bees, Buds, and Blooms, we haven't quite figured out for this year yet. We're, we may be looking at bloom times. Mm -hmm. Our work from 2012 with, with, bloom, with new bloom times this year. Whatever we have, we will eventually get up onto the Penn State Southeast Research and Extension Center website. It will take a while, but whatever we have, we could try to put up there. Awesome. Um, I'm again just seeing more kind words, wonderful presentation. Um, uh, she, Alvin's wondering, are you familiar with Menarda Klein? Can you address how beneficial? If you are. Klein, C L I N E. Uh K L I N E. Thank you. I am not. This okay. is this is a cultivar. Yes. Um, I guess the first thing I would want to find out is it a is it a cultivar of Didyma, the red one, or a cultivar of fistulosa? There are quite a few different Menardas out there. So finding out which Menarda it's a cultivar of would, would be the first thing. And and I, I would encourage anyone that has cultivars in their yard to do a little citizen science on your own. And um, we've often asked people to do this, and if they, we know they have a specific cultivar, just say, would you, would you watch that plant during the summer? And let us know, is it being visited? You know, are, are pollinators stopping? Are they actually gathering pollen and nectar from that plant? It's about the only way we're going to know about all of these is to have have people observe. Yep, a, a few of uh, garden peers have said that it's Menarda uh, didyma. Sorry, I'm saying it wrong, I'm sure, but I don't know if that oh, helps. Jacob Klein, is that what you think? Possibly, is? someone mentioned that as well. Like I said, I was just reading what he had verbatim written, but yes, possibly Jacob Klein. Jacob, yes, he's Jacob saying. Klein didn't, didn't do too badly in Annie's, in Annie's study. Wow. So, yeah, so, and that's supposed to be a little bit more mildew resistant than straight species. Awesome. So some good news, Alvin. Um, and David wonders, how do you account for soil and microecology differences in statewide pollination studies? Might these affect insect populations and plant performance? That's a very, um, very astute observation. Yes, they probably do. And, and the biggest problem that we have with any of these studies is there's so many variables um, in our own plot, in our bees, buds, and bloom plot, from one end of the plot to the other, you know, the soils are the same, but plants perform differently. And we're not quite sure why. There, there may be some subtle differences there. Um, and will that, there, there's a lot more to learn. Um, we don't really know exactly how the fertility of the soil affects, affects you know, pollen and, and nectar um, quality. There's, yeah, there's a lot we don't know. 
And but that's that's a very good point. Right. No, and he's agreeing with you. He's saying great presentation, lots of work to still be done. Um, and again, uh, this is wonderful knowledge, um, extremely useful to home gardeners, writes Jennifer. So again, just a lot of what's rolling in is, is sincere appreciation. So thank you, Connie. We appreciate all you gardeners out there helping our pollinators and planting. Certain. Um, my friends, I'll give one more minute to see if any other questions roll in. Um, but if you like um, dialing in to gardening programs online, I know the library has several coming up in the months ahead. Next Thursday, same time, um, there's uh, Secrets of a New Perennial Garden with garden consultant Deborah Tudd. Um, we have a Gardening with Native Wildflowers presentation um, uh, by Virginia Master Naturalist Amy Mason, and that will be both in person and online. We've got house plants coming up. We've got a benefits of snakes program. So definitely check out the library calendar when you have a chance because there's a lot of good stuff coming up. And Connie, I'm not seeing any new questions. So again, um, I just express our collective appreciation for everything you've done. I um, can already tell already this will be a much watched recording on the library systems YouTube channel. That is helpful. All right. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.